praise you, Heavenly Father. There's a lot of words that are spoken on a daily basis. None more important than the name Yeshua, Jesus. To speak that name into your situations over as a covering. There's a reminder every time we speak the name of Jesus, our standing before the Father. Every time we use the name of Jesus, it's a reminder of the covenant that he made with us. Every time we speak in the name of Jesus, it reminds God of the covenant. Not that he needs to be reminded. It's more like we sometimes forget. But it's that bond that we have through Yeshua. Amen? Amen. I think we should use that name, not profanely, but use that name time and time again to speak over our family, our children. You know, to speak over life situations wherever we come into. You go into work, probably the first word you should use is say, in the name of Jesus. I'm going to have a fruitful day on the workplace. In the name of Jesus, I'm going to see somebody come to know the Lord today. In the name of Jesus, at the very least, I'll be able to pray for them in the name of Jesus. Oh, I tell you what, what an awesome name. Would you turn in your Bibles with me to Exodus chapter 17? Last week was uh, our resurrection day, our Super Bowl, so to speak, for the church. That is, you know, it should be a glorious time, a day that we're just relish and be grateful. And I wanted to continue a reflection on Jesus, a reflection on uh, the prophetic as well, as because God gave so many proofs and gave so many symbolisms of the prophet that was going to come. And there's so many lessons to take place in this that we're going to take a look at today. And so there's going to be a lot of things going on. I hope you stay with me. Uh, so Exodus chapter 17. Skip all the way down to verse 1. Just see if you're with me. It's like, what? The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses. They said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah, because the Israelites quarreled, and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Heavenly Father, we come before you, and we thank you so much, Lord God, for the lessons that we can learn here. Because while these lessons may have been taught to the Israelites, thousands of years ago, Lord God, the lessons stand true for us. And we pray, Father, Lord God, that you would speak life and truth in our lives. Lord God, regardless of how we came here today, we pray, Lord God, that when we leave, we will be different, changed, Lord God, even in the smallest of ways, even in ways that we may not yet see, but we leave knowing that you're going to do an incredible thing in our lives. And so, Father, we thank you. And Father, we give you all praise, glory, and honor for everything that is said, everything that is done, and everything that we become. It's in 
the name of Jesus, we pray. And everybody said, look to your neighbor and just say, yes, I got that water from the rock. <laughs> Wherever we find ourselves, no matter where we may be, we must believe that God desires the best in our lives, even if those, those journeys end up taking us through the desert, even if it seems like a discipline, even if it seems like, wow, what is going on in my life? Where is God? You have to understand that God loves you. If you don't get that down right from the very beginning, then everything else begins to change. Everything else gets lost along the way. Because that has to be the preface. If you begin to go through trials not believing, really believing that God loves you, you're going to come up with a lot of things. You're going to repeat what the Israelites did as well. So right from the very beginning, your preface in life should be that, yes, God loves me. If you want to sing the song, yes, I, you know, this I know, right? For the Bible tells me so. But these are the things that we teach our children from the very beginning. And somehow, some way along, somewhere along the way, I mean, we get beaten up by life, do we not? I mean, this world loves to beat, beat people down. And we begin to become a lesser version of ourselves as life goes on. You know, and, 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 but we teach our children these truths, and as we continue on, you know, it's, how come we forget them at times? Because we get so filled with rational thought. We get so filled with so many things. You know, children go into it, man, and they just believe. Okay, the Bible says so. I believe it. If I ever asked my son when he was young if God loved him, he would say, yes. How do you know? Because the Bible tells me so. I mean, that's just the way it was. It's simple. No wonder Jesus said, listen, unless you come to me like these little children, you'll have no part in heaven. Because there's a simplicity. Simplicity. That simplistic faith, when you tell your child and they do it, and they just believe it to be true, we would sit there and say, that's just not rational thought. They have to reason it through. You know, we have to be able to f put science to it and everything else. Listen, I love science. You know, I'm a geek. I mean, I can talk to you about anything. You know, I love it. And that's not the point, though, is it? God didn't say, prove me but with your science. Prove who I am with anything else. No, you must believe that he exists. In verse 6, God tells, you know, he tells Moses about a rock at Horeb, which means barren or desolate. This whole place, they're in the desert, they're in the wilderness. It is desolate, it is barren. It's the reason why God its name. And it's interesting, sometimes we can come in those places in our own lives that seem barren or desolate. And we have to believe that God can bring forth life even in the middle of a wasteland. And I don't know what you may be going through in your life. I don't know what you may be facing tomorrow. Maybe you don't even know what's going to be happening tomorrow. But sometimes our lives can feel empty and unfulfilled. And God is saying, listen, I've got something good for you. You continue on your journey. Don't give up and watch what I will do. In Isaiah 43, 19, it says this. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way where? In the desert. I am making a way in the desert and streams in the wasteland. And so you may be going through a tough situation, but you got to come back to that verse believing that God is making a way. That somehow, somewhat, you may not see the way out of a desert, and if you're smack dab in the middle of a desert, all you'll see is sand and horizon for miles, as far as the eye can see. Maybe, if you're fortunate, you'll stumble on, onto a, an oasis. But if you're looking at it, in the middle of a desert, what you're seeing, it seems like it's lifeless. It seems like it's barren, it's dry, it's hot. Scorching temperatures by day, and it gets bone chilling at night because there's no humidity, no humidity to, you know, to keep and stabilize the temperatures. Without humidity, without moisture in the air, temperatures fluctuate greatly. And this is what it's like in the desert. And this is what the people are going through. They're marching through the desert and now they find themselves filled with thirst. You know, thirst is a very powerful trial, isn't it? 
You can go for days without food. You may grumble and you may stumble and you may complain, you know, and uh, you know you may get hangry from time to time. They say, right? That's when you need your Snickers. Just kidding. I should make commercials. Now, anyway. <laughs> But the truth is, is that, yeah, we can get hangry, right? And we get so, we can get upset. But you know what? You can go about 40 days without food. What you can't do is go 40 days without water. It begins to take a toll on your body much quicker than going without food. You can only go and live with about three days without food, without water. With food, you can go, like I said, around 40. Jesus fasted for 40 days. Many throughout the Bible fast, and even today there are people that fast 40 days. And so you can go for a long time. It's interesting. It is so dramatic that really the people were losing. They couldn't see the way in the desert anymore. They couldn't see it, and they just got started. It's not like they're a long time in the desert here. They haven't even sinned where they began to wander in the desert. Right now, they've got purpose, and they're driven, and they're focused, and they're going forward. And yet, they're complaining this quickly. It's just amazing. And when I think about this, you know, of all the suffering that Jesus went through, you think about all of it, the beatings, the plucking of the beard, being lashed you know, uh, with the 40 lashes minus one and everything that he went through, right? You know, the only time we ever have him acknowledge any kind of pain or any kind of anything that's going on with the tortures and everything else is when he was thirsty. It's the only time he ever mentioned. We don't have him like, ah, that hurts. Oh, please stop it. No. On the cross, in John 19, 28, he says, I am thirsty. The only time thirst has a way of beating you down, that's no, no doubt, no lie. But no matter the trial, the Israelites got to themselves into a place that they never learned about God's provision in life. May we never get to a point, no matter what we may be going through, that we can no longer trust God to get us through to, you know, whatever desert, whatever experience we may be going through, that we never be able to see that no matter what's going on, I know that my God is going to show up big. Do you believe that your God is going to show up big in your life? And it goes right back to, do you believe that God loves you? If you believe that he loves you, then you have to believe that he's making a way through the desert experience that you may be going through. Whatever it may be, no matter how dry you may be, no matter what the pain you may be suffering, God is going to make a way because he loves you. You know, Israel had such a short-term memory. You think about it. They just really got started in their journey. They had seen these plagues, miraculous plagues in Egypt. They watched what Moses had done. They watched the parting of the sea. They watched the, you know, the Egyptians coming after them and the, whole, uh, the massive army getting swallowed up in the Red Sea, all these things going along, and yet they're complaining. They begin to grumble. It just wasn't going to stop. <laughs> you know, the, the, the mindset should be, hey man, I wonder what God's going to do now. And I know when I'm on this side of the pulpit, it's a lot easier than when I'm on the other side of the pulpit. Because on the other side of the pulpit, I know, is life. It's easy here to talk about it. But I talked from this side of the pulpit already going through an awful lot of this life, knowing that my God has always proved faithful in every single trial. I may have doubted. I may, not have, I may have lost my way from time to time, not being able to find my way out of the desert. But God has always shown up big in my life. He has always been able to show me which way to go. And I'm here to tell you, no matter what it is that you're going through, the God that got me out of some pretty bad jams will get you out of it as well. Amen? You, see, you have to understand, right now Moses is following the direction of the Lord. He, can, he is following everything that God is telling them. Like I said, it's pretty early in the stages as they just left Egypt. You know, and it's interesting, it's, this is when the trials begin. And sometimes we're always looking like, hey, listen, maybe there's sin in your life. Maybe there's this, maybe there's that. For Moses, 
For these people, they were following and doing exactly what God wanted them to do. And yet, the severe thirst, and it was a big problem. You see, you have to understand that we're not always exempt from trials of this, uh, from this life. Even if we're following the directions of the Lord, there's still going to be trials. We fool ourselves. We think that there's not going to be that. But we have to understand that God had a plan from the very beginning. And as we will see, it was revelatory as well. It's interesting. They come to that question, hey, yeah, listen, is God with us or not? It's just amazing. You got the pillar by day, you know, you got a pillar of cloud by day, you got a fire, pillar of fire at night. No, God's not here. Now, how does that happen? How does a pillar of fire, you know, exist? I mean, I've been looking at it in amazement. And it goes, it's leading us, it's there to protect us, it's there to, it's amazing. Listen, there's a lot of things that God's already done in your life. You have got to understand that God is always with you every step of the way. But there was a problem. They began to quarrel. In Exodus 17, 2, it says, So they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. They quarreled. The word here in the Hebrew for quarreling isn't just having strife, not just you know, being able to quarrel and argue and things like that. No. It is actually being and waging a lawsuit. It's to conduct a lawsuit, uh, to contend with. Uh, to make a charge against. The people were coming against Moses and they were bringing, in essence, a lawsuit. They wanted him out of there. They were done. You know, we're dying, you know, here. How are we going to feed our cattle? How are we going to get enough water to feed them? You got to remember, there's about two million people plus cattle, plus all the animals that are with them. That's an awful lot of water. There is nothing around and they're feeling the pain of that. Where are you going to get this, Moses. But that kind of quarreling can rob us of so many blessings from the Lord. They're bringing a charge against God. And the very last thing that they say, you know, in this proves that very, very thing. You know, you think about it, what do they say? The very last verse we read in verse 7, it says, is the Lord among us or not? That was the charge, really, in essence of everything. That's what they wanted to know. That's why they were bringing this lawsuit. We want to know. It's like, you know, it's not like God just checked out here. <laughs> Do you remember all those miracles? You know, he's leading you to greater things. When we don't trust God for help, we are actually putting him to the test. Have you ever thought about that? Every time you lack faith, every time you begin to question, you're basically putting God to the test. It's okay to have, you know, to go through things in this life and to wonder and things like that. But when you do things, especially in the way that the Israelites did it at this particular time, you were putting him to the test. Moses replies in verse 2 after they're saying, you know, give us water to drink. And Moses replies, why do you quarrel with me? Why are you bringing a charge against me? Why are you bringing this lawsuit against me? Moses had been following the Lord. He has been following every directive that God has given him so far. So why are you coming to me, he's telling them. You know, why do you put the Lord to the test? Uh, it's interesting because there's many people that think that ministry leaders have all the answers. Hey, aren't you called? Surely if you're called, you got the answers. And I'm here to tell you right now, maybe there's some that do, but I'm going to tell you right now, I do not have all the answers. Didn't seem to be much of a shock. I thought I would get at least one gasp. <laughs> oh, no way! The truth is, <laughs> we don't have all the answers. But what's important is, you have to understand that that's a trap. You know, to take ownership of something that you have no control over. If you're in ministry, I hope that's liberating for you. That you don't take on ownership of things that you have no ownership of. Are you praying? Are you seeking God? Are you doing your best as God is leading you? We have to understand there's things that we just don't know. 
And don't take that ownership. But isn't that true for everybody? We don't know exactly what even tomorrow's going to bring. So to sit there and say, I know the mind of God, I do not. But one thing I do know is that I will live faithfully to him. I will trust him because I know he has my best. He's my father, to which I cry, Abba, Father. In John 3.27, I love this. You should write this down. If you ever have a problem of taking ownership of things that you don't, shouldn't take ownership of, if people are putting things on you and asking you, and like, hey, what, what's going on in your life? Where is that? Where is this? John 3.27 is great. John the Baptist was asked this very thing, and he, he goes through it, and, and he replies to them, like, hey, listen, you know that guy you just baptized, and the, thing, you know, the guy you just said all those good things about? Well, people are going over and flocking to him. And before, the, before John ever said, John the Baptist ever says that, you know, hey, I must decrease and he must increase, before he ever says that, he says this, a man can receive only what is given him from heaven. How relieving that must be. You can only do, you can only receive what God gives you. And I'm going to add to that a little bit. I know we're not supposed to add to the Word of God, but there's a little bit of insight in this. This is true, but also you can only receive it in the time that He gives you. I mean, the timing is everything God will give you when you need it, at the time you need it. He's not abandoning you. The Israelites began to demand things from Moses and God. And we've got to be careful of that, that kind of demand. Give us water to drink. You know, they were following Moses. And so they had something to sit there and say, hey, listen, you know, Moses, I don't know if you know, but there's a couple million people here. I don't know if you look behind you, but we're still here, and we need water. Can you do something about that? They didn't do anything like this. They didn't seek God. They didn't do anything. It's the attitude to which they were bringing it. You know, this attitude. It's like, hey, listen, give us something to drink. You know, you owe us. You know, they weren't waiting. They weren't asking or anything else like that. They were demanding it. They assumed the worst from God as well. You know, we not only do we have to watch our attitudes when pressures come around and the trials of life, we've got to watch our attitudes, but we also have to not assume the worst from God. There's people that will get blessings from God, and I've heard them say this. Well, I wonder how long I'm going to have this because you know whatever I got is going to break or whatever I've gotten is going to be taken away from me or whatever I've received. Whoa, stop talking like that. If God has blessed you with it, for however ever long you may have it, maybe he blessed you with it to give it to someone else. Maybe that is true. Maybe to be a blessing to someone else. But stop talking so negative because what happens is when we begin to talk negative, we begin to project it upon God. And we begin to project it on God. We get negative about God. You know? Listen to what they said in verse 3. They're telling Moses, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? Yeah, that's what God had intention. He's going to free you from slavery, from those bonds, from the cruelty of the Egyptians, and he's going to starve you in the desert. He's going to make you die of thirst in the desert. Remember, before this, they get the manna too, right? They complain about food, he gives them manna. Complain about water, he eventually gives them water, as we saw. But it's interesting. We can be like that if we're not careful. We have got to make sure we don't allow a spirit of complaint ever coming on us. Amen? The truth is, it's what I said in the beginning. Do you believe that God loves you? Do you believe because he loves you, he wants the best for you? Which means at times it's going to discipline you because we know Scripture bears out it's the truth of any good father. When they discipline their child, they have the best interest. So if they're going to discipline, when God disciplines, it's going to be perfect. It's going to be the right amount of discipline because he's going to nudge you in the way you should go. It may be painful at the time because no one likes discipline. But in the end, it results of righteousness and freedom. In Matthew 7, 11, it says this, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask Him? 
See, God wants to give you good gifts. He's a what? A good, good father. A good, good father. I was going the psalm, but yes, you're right. He's a good father. Amen? He loves you. Therefore, when he gives you something, it's going to be a good gift. Because he wants you to, ha- to be blessed. He wants you to be on that path of righteousness. He wants only good for you. But if you get into this life and you begin to follow God and all of a sudden you come to these hiccups and you begin to start questioning and you begin to doubt that he even loves you, if you begin to have, and and how many people have low self-esteem? Where they have low self-esteem about themselves, again, they project it upon God. Why would a God like someone like me? Why would God love someone like me? That's low self-esteem and you're projecting on God that he may or may not like you or love you. And that is wrong. That is erroneous. That is from hell. That has nothing to do with the truth. And that is that God loves you. Maybe you've done some, some very troubling things in your life. Maybe very immoral things in your life. But have you asked for forgiveness? then God's forgiven you. Amen? Don't doubt whether or not you're forgiven. You've asked for forgiveness. He says I, he is just and faithful to forgive you. I don't have time to get into just because that's all deal with the legal code there. I'd love to get into that. But legally, he's bound to forgive you. And because he's faithful, he will do it. Think about that. He legally bound himself. That's why he will do it. You have to understand the God we serve. That's why it shouldn't be that negative mindset that it's all doom and gloom. Oh, he's got something out for me. Oh, my life isn't turning out the way I wanted it to. Start looking at it that maybe God is blessing you in the life that you have. That he's blessing you right where you're at. And he's moving you. And maybe all these things are going around. You don't know until you get to heaven exactly what your life was going to mean and how it was going to mount up. They question God's presence and power in their lives. Remember when I said, you know, in Exodus 17, 7, they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? What they were really saying is, okay, we're supposed to worship this God, Moses? Okay. Well, if he doesn't provide this water, I don't know if he's worthy to be worshipped. That was the heart of the matter. They were testing whether or not he is there. Whether or not He is worthy to be worshipped. If he doesn't meet my needs, I don't know if I should worship him. Do you see how, I mean, that's like a brat. (laughs) That goes beyond just childlike behavior. That is a spoiled brat. Oh, yeah, I know you gave us those, you know, you did those ten plagues. I know you spared us and, you know, and everything else. You got us out from bondage. And I know you provided so much for us along the way. And I know you saved us from the Egyptians. But we want water now. We want water now. I mean, it's like, it's like spoiled. Where's the temper tantrum going? That's exactly what it was like. They forgot, and they all were sitting there saying, listen, if you can't give us this water now, are you really worthy to be served, worshipped? I mean, come on. We could be like that. We don't get what we want when we want it. And God looks at us and says, man, you're a spoiled child. <laughs> you know, <laughs> listen, have you never withheld something from your child, <laughs> you know, all for their benefit? You had to have. You couldn't give a child everything they wanted because you know that won't teach them life's lessons along the way. And as a parent, not a friend, as a parent, I'm supposed to teach my child. I only had one. Children in your case. And we're only supposed to teach our children what they need to, to become not dependent on me, but dependent on God. It's a shifting of dependencies as a parent. That's what it's all about. But they wanted to know. They were unhappy with God's provision. So how did God answer them? And it's interesting. <laughs> you have, it's interesting when I take a look at these passages and I, and I see there, what's written down is all about the quarreling. The quarreling is mentioned, but you know what? When God gave them the water, what you don't get? Whoa, thank you, Moses. Hey, listen, when you're talking to God, can you say thank you very much? 
man, I am so grateful you brought that water. There's no mention of a grateful attitude. None. And you can take a look at the passage, not just this one. How many times there's a complaint, but you never have a thanksgiving. May we never be a people that when we receive something from God, we can't look up to heaven and say, thank you so much for all that you have given me. I don't care if it's a drop coming down. If I got a drop to quench my thirst, thank you for that. I know it's manna every single day and I long for meat, but you know what? Thank you, God, for providing for me every single day. We've got an attitude and it's fostered here in America, you know, that we just want something here and now. Let's get over ourselves and give God the praise and glory and honor that's due Him and Him alone. Amen? I mean, that's a people that need, that's a people that He wants to worship Him no matter what we go because a mature person says, I know that my God is so good that I may be going through some trials, but I don't know what spiritual battle I may be fighting. I don't know what demonic, demonic stronghold I may be needing to tear down. But whatever it is, I know God has my back, that God will sustain me and give me the strength I need to see myself through. So I'm going to stop the complaining. I'm going to be mature about this. And know he, though He's slain, me, I will serve him. Though he slay me, I will never deny him. Though he slay me, I will serve him all the way, whatever it might be. That is the attitude that God wants from his people. And so God answers them. He provides for his people with a miracle, which won't only satisfy their need, but speak of something in the future, something that is yet to come. In Exodus 17, 5 and 6, it says this, The Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people and take with you some of the elders. The last time Moses did this, he was told to take 70 elders. Most likely it's the same 70. Most likely he's told to walk on ahead of the people so that there would be witnesses to this miracle. He says, Take the elders of Israel and take your staff Take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. Taking that staff was a reminder of every, and God even says it, of which you struck the Nile. Take that staff of which you used, that I used through you, to part the sea, to provide the plagues, to continue to speak to these people. It's a reminder. Every time Moses picked up that staff, it was a reminder that God was with him. It was a reminder of the power of God. There was nothing in that staff. The staff had absolutely no power. It was the God behind it. Amen? Every time you recall a memory that God has done something in your life, it's like you picked up the staff. It's a reminder that how God's got you this far in life, he's going to carry you all the way to the end. Do not give up on him. He builds miracles upon miracles upon miracles upon miracles. And every time that happens, it builds our faith. We become mountains of faith, strongholds for the Lord to use us. He says, I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. There are instructions given to Moses. You think about it couldn't have been created by a man. Who in the world writes, would write that and sit there and say, well, you know what? I was, I was cornered, didn't know exactly what to do, so I just thought of it. I'm going to go over and I'm going to strike that rock and water's going to come out of it. No one in their right mind would have come up with that. If I, was leading, if, if I didn't have God behind me, you know, if I would say something so incredulous like that, would you sit there and follow me? No. You sit there and say, oh, wow, I think Moses has been in the sun a little too long. <laughs> He's going to go and strike that rock, but I, I think, you know, I think we, the pressure got to him. <laughs> Maybe we pushed him a little too hard. You know, he's going to talk to, you know, to strike a rock here. There's no one that would come up with that on their own. That's the point. When God does something, when it's a miracle, it's usually not something that we really always think of. Because God works everything out together for good. He can speak to whatever's going on in your life. And you think about it, all the miracles that happened in your life. How many times did you predict that that was going to happen? Oh, I knew God's going to do that. 
<laughs> no. I didn't even see my own salvation coming. You know, I, I thought, you know, when I first went to church, I thought, there's no way I'm going up the first day. I'm going to stay here. I don't know what happened. I was in my pew and I was praying to God and said, God, I don't want to get up there because it's going to look like it. And somewhere along the line, I'm standing at the altar to the altar call. I'm standing there. I was in the pew. You know, they had definitely wooden pews then. <laughs> this is where I'm dated. Not even cushions on those wooden pews. And here I am at the altar. I didn't see that coming. So many things in my life happened I would never saw coming. But God it just has the way he is able to do it, isn't it? And so they go through, and he's told to strike the rock. If they wanted water, you're going to have to strike the rock. It's interesting because what is said here is that in the NIV, it says that he stood, God stood beside the rock. But the Hebrew in here doesn't show that. It shows that he stood on the rock. Moses knew exactly which one to go to because God was standing on the rock. He was on that rock itself. And he tells him, you're going to go and you're going to have to strike the rock. This is exactly what he was going to have to do. If the people wanted water, Moses was going to have to strike the rock. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul writes this. This is the prophecy that was happening here with Israel. And the Apostle Paul writes this, is, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud, and that they all passed through the sea. We're talking about the parting of the Red Sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them. And that rock was Christ. Now, you can sit there and say, oh, yo, Pastor, you, you know, how can you read this into it? I didn't read into it. The Apostle Paul, in his letter to the Corinthians, tells us exactly what is going on. That God, Jesus, was there that day. That rock of our foundation was Yeshua, Hamashiach. That's who it was. If Moses hadn't struck the rock, there wouldn't have been any water. In the same way, unless Jesus would have been struck Placed on, the cry, placed on the cross, there would be no water of life, no salvation. In Isaiah 53, 4, you talk about Jesus having to be struck. Listen to this. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced. For our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. God wasn't just quenching this thirst, he was showing them that there was going to come one day. This is a prophetic foundation of something that was going to happen. A prophet that would come in the same way, who, the same likeness of Moses. This was a prophetic telling. In Psalm 95, 1, it says this, Come, let us sing for, for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Amen? You know, when Jesus, it was interesting, when Jesus was struck, pierced through the side, isn't it interesting, the Bible went out of its way to tell us it wasn't just blood that came out, but it was blood and water. He was struck, and blood and water came out. And God says, when you strike that rock, water will come out from it. One thing you have to understand, there was nothing that people could do to earn that water. They didn't earn that water. In fact, if anything, God could have been rightfully withholding that water. It wasn't deserved, and it was free. And it was get for everyone who wanted to participate in it. But well, that's the point, wasn't it? The water was there. It was a river coming through. Think about it. There's two million. It couldn't have been just a little trickle stream. It couldn't have been just a little thing coming out. There's two million people 
No wonder the Bible clearly says it was a stream coming out from there. They had to feed or water two million people plus all the cattle, everything else they brought with them. That's an awful lot of animals that need to be eat, you know, need to eat. All their livestock, and it provided for them. But here's the trick: it wasn't enough for God to provide the water. They actually had to go and drink of it. It wasn't enough that it's just there. They could have looked on and wow, that's really nice. But that's you don't see that every day. Water from a rock. Wow, that's cool. <laughs> they had to go and drink it. They had to go and fill up whatever they needed to fill up. They weren't just, you know, putting their mouth in there and sopping up. They may have done that, but they were filling whatever jars and whatever thing that they could. They were taking as much water as possible. And God provided in the middle of a desert from a rock. What can God do for you in your life? What is God doing right now that because maybe you're in the desert with the pressures of the desert, you can't see the way because God is doing a new thing. Who ever heard of water from a rock before? But there would be another water that would come. And that would be the water from the rock of Jesus. The water of life. In John 4.14 it says this, But whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water, welling up to eternal life. This is the rock, the spiritual water that the Apostle Paul wrote in First. Corinthians. In Revelation 21 6, it says this, he said to me, it is done. Where else have you seen or heard that words done? When Jesus was on the cross, it is finished. It is done. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. No cost. It is free. Because you couldn't pay for it anyway. It was beyond your ability to pay. So one, pay that price for you. You know, I think about this. Every time someone gets saved, I think about that verse. They have drank from the waters eternal waters that have been provided by Jesus. And every time they do that, it's almost a little prophetic of what was going on thousands of years ago. It was free. The only problem is, with that water that God provided in the desert, they would need to drink again. Because it only satisfied the flesh. This water that Jesus talked about satisfies the soul. But it's no different in the sense that God was the only one that could provide it. No one could plan it. It could only have been planned by God. Who would have thought that God would send his only son to die on the cross for our sins? We never thought about that. It was free. Nothing we do to earn it. But just like the people of Israel, you have to be the one to drink it. There's a lot of things that go on in life. We talk about the water from the rock, not just from a rock, from Jesus. God has got something for you. He loves you so much. Let us be and strive to that maturity, no matter what happens, goes on in our lives, that he has the, our best intentions at hand. Amen? He loves you this morning. There me, that, that means he will take care of you. Because he loves you, you're his child. Let's not doubt him and therefore put him under some test. But instead, let us embrace it. No matter what we may go through, understand that God will make a way out. He did so for the Israelites. We know one thing about God. There is not one special person among us that gets any kind of you know, special privilege. No. Everybody is equal before God. We are all his sons and daughters. Amen? We are his children. And he loves us equally. That's an amazing thing. He, he can't love you any more or less than the person to the right or left of you. 
He doesn't love them any less than he loves you, nor more than he loves you. He can't. He loves us, each one of us, perfectly. With everything that he has, he loves us. Let's pray. Thank you, Father. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. Your word just speaks truth and life to us. And everything in your Bible, Lord God, everything that you did wasn't just happenstance. There was a reason why you chose that rock. There was a reason why you chose a rock to produce the water. Surely you could have just produced water from the ground. But you chose it from a rock because you had more than just providing water. You were giving life lessons. You were giving revelation of what was to come in the prophetic, Lord God. And we thank you so much. And of all the ways you could have provided, you provided it that way. And Father, we thank you for the rock that we know as Jesus. And Lord God, you provided that water of life that sustains the soul, that brings eternal life in each and every one of us. Lord God, those that have accepted Jesus Christ and made him Lord and Savior of their lives. You provided that water. You provided salvation for all of us. For you are the rock of our salvation. But we have to be willing to accept that. In Romans 10, 9, it says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. If you have never accepted Jesus before, those who are online, those who are here, and you would say, yes, I want to know him as my Lord and Savior. I may have doubted that he was with us. The truth is, I can sense him even now. And you're saying in your heart, I need my life to be different. Going on the path I've been going is not bringing life, but destruction. I do not feel good about the direction my life is going. Then my question is, why go on that same path? Why not change it? change direction. And if you're ready to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, would you join me in this prayer based off of Romans 10, 9? Would you just repeat after me? Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus is the answer to all my needs. I believe that you raised Jesus from the dead and that Jesus is Lord so I ask you, Jesus, to forgive my sins and to be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, let someone know. It's important that you let someone know of your decision. We have materials here we'd like to get to. We have Bibles and other materials we'd like to get you to. Fill out the form online. Make sure we'll put in there your decision today. You'll see that QR code and the, at the website address. That's going to be coming up on the screen as well. If you do that, let us know of your decision. And if you have need of any of our material, we'll send a Bible out to you this week. Let us know. If you're here, see me afterwards. Talk to one of the elders. We have materials here at the altar. We'll get it to you. God's a good God, is he not? And he loves you so much. What he did as we celebrated last week, the resurrection of our Lord, only he could have done that. And he didn't do it because he didn't love you. He did it because he did love you. And before he would bring final judgment upon this earth, upon all the evil deeds, First and foremost, upon the demonic realm, Satan himself, he provided you and I a way out. That's how much he loves us. I'm going to ask right now as the worship team leads us, regardless of what you may be going through today, I'm going to ask if you would come forward. Whatever it is that you have need of, if it is salvation, accepted the Lord for the first time, we'll, we'll 
walk you through that. We'll make sure that you understand the decision you made. We'll make sure that you have material to take with you. We will always be there in case you have a question. We'll always be in the middle of the week, whatever. But if you have a need in your life, maybe a need for someone, these altars are open. Take advantage of them while you're here today. Lunch can wait. I'm starving, but lunch can wait. It's still kind of early. If God is speaking to you, take the time now. Because when we leave here, you know what happens. Not yet. So, oh, I wanted to pray. I wanted to do this. Take that time now. Let's seek him, church. He's a good, good.